Well, ladies and gentlemen, when we speak about our next session, you're going to ask us, there's a definite spotlight on food. Well, there is, because now this next really interesting ses session, um, we welcome on the stage somebody who will talk about multi-sensory branding in retail, specialty dining. Ladies and gentlemen, the founder, Fabrica by Chef Sabi. Please put your hands together for Chef Sabia Sachi Gorai. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. And it's amazing to be here. I'm generally always on a forum where we are either smelling food or cooking food or serving food. The first time in a forum where uh, I'm seeing everything else that happens outside uh, the food world. And it's quite exciting. And, and for me, it's almost like a learning experience. Uh, so I, it was very interesting when Chanda told me to come and speak here in this forum. And the subject that was given to me was multi-sensory branding in retail. Obviously, it's a retail show, and I'm assuming, or I did assume, after reading and understanding a bit, that we're trying to collaborate these two and uh, probably talk from my point of view of where uh, modern dining, modern food, or let's say Indian dining experience can uh, uh, coexist, correlate, uh, gel with what you are doing here, and benefit from each other. Uh, so a few quick uh, uh, slides, I'm going to run through it. And if there is a question uh, posed, I'll be happy to answer. Uh, there are a few food pictures which hopefully would make you salivate. You'll have to do come to our restaurants. The food court was also out of this uh, way, I realized. When I went for a coffee, I realized a bit of a walk. So we'll do everything but uh, only looking at food pictures. Okay. Uh, so my name is Sabi. I was the culinary director for the Olive Group, which is one of India's finest uh, restaurant chain. Uh, in 2012, it got bought out by Aditya Birla. Uh, I had set up about uh, 17 odd restaurants by then. Today, uh, Olive is in uh, seven cities, I think about 32 restaurants. Uh, I started my life as a, uh, a chef, then went on to become a culinary director, then got into restaurant design, uh, primarily because I had an art degree and I had interest in doing something with interior, uh, to do with uh, something beyond the food, create an experience where food can bind and you can come into a space where uh, you enjoy the space, you enjoy uh, the food, you enjoy the experience. So that's what I'm going to quickly talk about. Let's see if this, okay. Uh, so uh, we always say that behind every uh, chef, there is a, a story because the story is what makes it more compelling because all chefs cook good food and we all tr uh, try and cook with our passion, put our heart out. Kitchen, of course, is a very difficult space to work at home. It's always the mothers, grandmothers, and uh, so on. Uh, however, in the professional world, it's mostly been always men, primarily because, not because we're good cooks, it's just because you have to survive. You have to survive you have to sustain and you have to pretty much deliver in t you know, trying conditions. The first thing that we talk about is wearing a white jacket in a place where there is maximum chance of getting stained. You know? So it's, uh, I think we almost like the Navy guys. You're in the ship and there's grease. You're in the kitchen, there is uh, the dal stain and there's turmeric and chili flying everywhere and yet you're wearing a white jacket. So it's a very interesting uh, uh, scenario. There's also a reason why we wear white jacket. So they're behind uh, every chef there is a story, and mine is, uh, I think, as, uh, uh, as exciting, as compelling as everybody else's. And the story is what uh, forms uh, your ideology about food, it forms your cuisine, it forms uh, who you are, and it also uh, actually tells uh, the audience or tells the diners of what the chef is trying to say. And I think apart from uh, without, uh, without the face, the food is not as, uh, as exciting. I, I think, at, I again go back saying at home it's uh, the mums or the grandmothers or the particular aunts food that we always talk about. Without that face, that food wouldn't have been that exciting. Uh, here I'm talking about uh, the current generation and uh, we've, I've been in the business for about 26 years. I have catered to some of uh, the people whose uh, children are today coming to our restaurants. Uh, so we started off in 93, uh, we, uh, we did various brands, some of them were very popular brands of Bombay, uh, happens to, one of them happens to be the Phoenix Palladium where I did the bowling company, and from that was 98 to now, uh, I've seen a major change in the, uh, the, the people coming through the doors of the restaurant, of course the age group has changed dramatically, 
the people uh, or the guests who are coming, their, their uh, expectations have changed dramatically. So we're constantly talking about millennials, we're constantly talking about uh, the younger generation in India. So this particular picture is of uh, my current restaurant in Pune, it's called Minority by Sabi. Now this has a beautiful story because my dad's a miner, we came from a mining town, I was born in Asansol, then moved around Ranigan, Dhanbad, Burga, Shol, Clear Sol, and you know the whole mining ta uh, areas of uh, West Bengal, later on Bihar, and later on Northeast. So I, I, uh, when I had an opportunity of doing a restaurant with my story, I thought why not do my own childhood where I had grown up in the mines. I never thought that it could be represented so beautifully because mines are generally arid, there's not much to look at, there's always a gloom, the air is always filled with uh, pollution or dust or coal dust. But yet, when it was told nicely, uh, it seemed like a fantastic experience. The food, of course, I do is I, I try and bring in the tribal food of these areas, which also talks about India or the people who live in these areas or the farm that grows indigenous ingredients in these areas. Um, so just to quickly recap, post Olive, uh, I, had, I had a chance to do something with my own personal experience. I have a family business, or my mama's has a family business in Japan. So I did the first Japanese restaurant called Ai. Later on it became Guppi. Uh, almost a, a year, two years later, I was told to do something different. And that's when I, I kind of went back into this whole, uh, my life on living in Bombay for about 14 odd years. My godmother is Parsi, so I said, okay, let's not, let's take that uh, you know, interesting experience of having the Irani chai outside the college at Dadar every morning, and I created the soda bottle, which happens to be one of Olive's premier restaurant today. So today, every time I'm talking of restaurants or food, I look back and I try to see wh where I come from, what I've grown into, uh, who, what are the experiences that, talk, you know, that brings me back to who I am. It also happened because at some point I migrated to Australia. I was living uh, and trying to make a career as a chef. But I realized it's as good uh, my Italian food or Japanese food is. I will never be accepted for who I am apart from being an Indian, being proud about being an Indian, cooking Indian food. So even in the finest restaurants, I worked at Tatsuya and Rockpool, two of Sydney's best restaurants. Every time I was asked that, you don't speak French, you're not white, why are you here? Okay, after that question is answered, the second question, can you make butter chicken? And as much as I hated it and I came from Olive and I was very proud about my pasta, but I had to make naan bread. I, for the life of me, I could never figure out why naan bread. Naan was roti or bread for us, but anyway. So I had to make naan bread and butter chicken. And I kid you not, the butter chicken tasted nothing like what we eat, and the naan bread was definitely not naan bread. It was something that I had to kind of cook up. Uh, so uh, moving on, what I'm trying to say is today, whenever I'm talking about experience or sensory dining or trying to club them together, I'm trying to dig back into my experience my childhood, my growing up years, my college. If you see even the, in, the, uh, the minority interiors, we'll, as, since it's a retail forum, I'm also gonna talk a little bit about how to interface interiors, furnitures into the same story. We'll go into it a little later. Uh, food experience, a sensory journey. A multi-sensory approach to the restaurant business, focusing investments on recreating stories, transplanting experiences, sharing histories, which is exactly what I was talking about. Here we have spoken about the three factors that makes our business tick. One, of course, is uh, the diner. Without a diner, you can't have a restaurant because you always see it from the other side. Uh, but in, in my business, the most important is the diner or the guest. Uh, second, of course, is very, very important is the chef, the guy who has to cook. And third is the restaurant owner. In my case, I'm both the chef and the restaurant owner. When the restaurant is empty, I also eat in my own restaurant. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, uh, so from looking from a business point of view, uh, you, like Sagar who spoke before, is a dear friend. And if you remember what he said that, I, I am not a chef, I'm not a foodie, I started selling Momo and I made a business out of it. So for a businessman, you could sell anything. It could be burger, it could be Momo, it could be samosa, it could be ragada patties, it could be fine Indian food, butter chicken, it doesn't really matter because I'm a businessman and I'm trying to do the best I can in the understanding that I have. Be, me being a chef, as in I started, off being, a, uh, started being a cook, uh, so obviously, uh, that I can never let go. That passion is always there, and that stops me from becoming a 100% businessman. Because I always want to see what am I selling. I want to see if what I'm selling, do I eat that? Can I eat that all the time? Can I serve it to my family? Can I serve it to my daughter? So those various questions uh, does not allow me to become a 100% businessman. Because uh, for a successful businessman, I have figured in the last six uh, years that I've been an entrepreneur that you have to only be looking at numbers. Uh, I somehow look at the numbers as a byproduct of my food. 
So I'm trying to make, I, I am saying, I'm not exactly a businessman, but I'm trying to make a living out of what I like to do, which I also I feel is amazing because if you can make a living out of what uh, you like doing, that's brilliant because a lot of us go uh, and do a job or do something that we are not very excited about. Uh, in my case, at least I'm happy uh, that I get to do what I, I enjoy doing. Uh, and like I said, the forks, the morning I get the best coffee in my restaurant, when there's nobody there, you sit in a beautiful place, you get this fantastic fresh brew of coffee. Uh, of course, uh, you, you uh, get to eat. I can't tell you the biggest fork of owning a restaurant is you get free laundry. I don't know if anybody guessed that before. Can anybody guess it? No, I'm sure not. So uh, the chefs get their laundry, so you can pass your laundries through that. So you don't have to worry your wife or at the buy at home about, a, about the laundry machine or a, or a washing machine or ironing. So those are the little perks of being in the kitchen industry. Uh, the food uh, experience. Seek unique experience of flavors, textures, aroma. Food is uh, consumed not only with its physical properties, but also psycho-emotional effects. Now, these are slightly complex terms today. We are trying to talk about these things. I'm constantly traveling internationally to talk about in different uh, you know, food forums. And the first question that I get asked today, thankfully I've gone you know, beyond that butter chicken and naan bread, that what is so unique about Indian food? Why should people eat Indian food? You know, and uh, people's perception of Indian food has always been a lot of masala, a lot of spice, chili, 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 hot, hot. But it's strangely it is not, as in we all know that it is not, but somehow I think we, it was badly represented. Flavors. Uh, I must tell you this very small thing. When I was opening my first restaurant, Lavash, in New Delhi, I said, let's create an aroma that would tell people that they have come to Lavash. Like, you know, you have an aroma that reminds you of a particular space, a home, a restaurant, a garden, uh, of a floral aroma of something in the childhood. So we created this aroma called the apple pie. It might sound very shallow because apple pie is food. What better I could I think of? But I can't tell you how amazingly it fit into the whole format. Is something like how when you go to an Irani bakery or you go past a bakery, uh, you smell this beautiful uh, sweet flavor in the air, which is basically dextrin. When you cook sugar or, or flour, the, dex the dextrose becomes dextrin that goes into the air and gives you that beautiful aroma that makes you salivate. So I just used the same principle and created an aromatizer which sprayed out or you know gave out this aroma of a freshly baked apple pie and worked beautifully for us. Today, almost everybody says, when I come to Lavash, there's an amazing aroma. A lot of people don't connect it to be apple pie, but they still enjoy the aroma and has this beautiful memory of going back to Lavash. Sight. Uh, it's becoming more and more and more complex as we are talking about Instagrammable food, restaurant interiors where you can stand and click a selfie. I saw a lot of people clicking a selfie with this crazy mannequin, I don't know if anybody noticed, which had no head and two legs. So, uh, so these kind of things are attracting us a lot because everything is today about being looking pretty, looking perfect, looking presentable. It is, uh, has to be something that could make your social media look uh, you know, very cool. So food has always been something that we've eaten with our eyes first, and we always say that. Today, if you see, we're taking it slightly more seriously. There's a lot of effort that has gone making that plate, but normally I would have put a little salad and put a piece, piece of fish, and I would have been done with it. But today, we're putting so much effort to make that plate look picture perfect, because you want to click a picture before you eat. That picture now goes out from your Instagram and goes to people, friends, your followers, who you don't even know, but you're connected on the, on the internet format, and talks about this one food, and then the questions come back. Where is it? What restaurant? What kind of food? What did you eat like? So various other ways also to promote what you're trying to do. Now, this is a beautiful thing I, I must uh, talk about. This is just an experience of sight or seeing or, or how sight can uh, entice or excite so many or evoke so many different emotions. So this is uh, my experience in Japan. Uh, Hanami, this is going to start now anytime in, in uh, I think, first March or end of March is when the sakura or the cherry blossom starts blossoming. Uh, so like we have Ganpati or we have Diwali or we have Dashera, this is probably Japan's biggest festival and it is purely based on the sensory uh, values of uh, watching. Or in, in, Jap in Japanese, hanami means look the flowers. <coughs> Sorry, look the flowers, which means the flowers are blo blossoming and you look at them. So basically, it's a festival that is built around just watching cherry blossom or sakura blossom. Now, 
the winter happens, the snow melts, and the sakura starts blossoming. Beautiful time to be in Japan. It's a spring, everything changes. Life becomes uh, uh, full of energy, full of fun, full of activity, full of festivals. There's an interesting line I once, re uh, 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 once read in one of these Tokyo uh, subway uh, signboards, which said, the beer can turns pink. Now imagine connecting these two. You have this beautiful sakura blossom happening, and here a company, which is probably either a uh, Sapporo or Asahi beer, changes the beer can, because I was looking at a lot of the packaging happening here. They changes the beer can, and the beer can has a print of the beautiful sakura flower. So now it's not just food. You're using your sensory values to connect it even to the drinks or the way you're marketing your product. Sound. Uh, kitchens are horribly noisy. I, can, I kid you not, as in I have like a ear problem. Uh, because this constant noise of cluttering of pots and pans, people shouting, screaming, uh, the various kind of noises. Interestingly, uh, we've always noticed that sound uh, uh, plays an important role. So I ran this uh, small little pub. I don't know if I'm sure if anybody has been, been there back in the 90s called the Copacabana. This was at the, anybody been to Copacabana? Everybody's, oh, you have, fantastic. Somebody from, from the, from the pre-millennial uh, group, I guess. Uh, so Copacabana was uh, from 92 to about, two about two, uh, 2000, yes. Post that, we opened Fire and Ice. Now, so we saw the value of the music. We saw the value of uh, you could bring in uh, uh, an experience just through music. Here, I am showing three things. One, there is a live performance going on, which is the old methodical way of either a DJ or a live performance. Second. We're creating music or sound through food. So the sizzler plate goes out and you have the sizzle. So obviously it connects with you. And you look at what's happening. And the third is the more classical, like an Indian fine dining restaurant, and you're playing classical music. Today, interestingly, a lot of restaurants around the world, especially the fine dines, are talking about not having any sound. Not having any sound itself is another sensory pleasure where you are going to a restaurant where nobody either talks or talks in mind, or you are just hearing the clutter of the, your own cutlery, or you're hearing the wine being poured in a glass, and things like that, which is also itself an experience. So the, the dining experience constantly changes or are changing, and we will have to adapt to it or come up with ideas where people can, uh, can feel uh, that this is something different, something new, or something that they can finally connect with. Taste, of course, uh, in my business, uh, I am a cook, so uh, taste is the most important thing. We always say it's, it's a taste, but then, you know, today we are also saying it's, uh, it's a sight. Uh, so, interestingly, as I grew up, as I read about it, as I traveled, I realized food is much more than just eating. It, is, it has to satisfy many other factors in the body. Uh, it is something that today I know is a, it, it's probably the biggest manifestation of uh, there, is, there is a God, there is, a, there is Mother Nature, because food is something that is the most basic necessity that one keeps us alive, gives us growth, gives us mental growth, and everything, so on and so forth, that you talk about is from food. And if the food is not tasty, of course, you don't feel like eating it. Today, we have a lot of issue with feeding the kids. Uh, so these are a quick uh, few points that of food when we Look at food, these are the few things I look at or I think of when I'm making a balanced menu, when I'm making a dining experience, when I'm planning a dish, I'm traveling and I'm cooking maybe in Spain or in Germany or in Italy. I also keep looking at the food factors that people like to eat or people like to you know, uh, enjoy. So these are the few food groups and this is how we classify food. This is exactly how Ayurveda classifies food today. Uh, or today we have learned that and that's what we're using in our own experiences. So I already had spoken about the apple pie uh, aroma. Interestingly, to a lot of restaurants, in, in fact, I also did it for a while, there is a th something called an aromatizer where you bring in a plate of uh, food or a dish and you carry that aroma and you spray it around like how you'll spray a perfume and walk into it and things like that. So you'll spray that to create the more uh, the experience. Uh, so what happens is, you're, let's say you're eating a steak and you want a little more flavor of the grill or the charcoal or whatever, that could be sprayed around in your table to give you a feel that you're actually sitting next to a live grill, eating something that really connects you. It's almost like having a, um, a you know, paneer tikka or a tandoori chicken out of a, a tandoor, where you really can you know, uh, get the beautiful aroma of the charcoal. S 
smell stimulates, smell uh, makes us hungry, smell makes us um, want to eat something. So it's a very important part of dining today that we want to make our food smell nice, of course. We want to create the surrounding smell nice and we want to create an experience around smell. So as much as we don't see it, but it's in a very, very, very important factor. Uh, one of my very dear friends is a perfumer from Paris, this German lady, and today I see her walking into Purane Delhi Chandni Chowk to constantly pick up ether, uh, keoda, uh, uh, a rose extract. And I was astonished to see that a rose extract at Purane Delhi Chandni Chowk cost much more than any branded perfume in the world. A 10 ml would cost as much as 10,000 rupees. 10 ml means like a small ampule because those are the natural ingredients are now going back in making uh, the, the high-end perfumes because everybody is now going out of synthetic aromas. They're saying we want something which is made out of natural. So the same aroma oils or uh, uh, aromatizers that we have used in kitchen or are been using is now also going back into making fine perfumes. Okay, this is a very interesting subject and also very debatable. We'll not get into the debate. But if you go by Ayurveda, it also says there's a great value of eating with fingers. Now, when we say fingers, it can become fingers to the elbow, so we're not going there in that subject. But yes, eating with fingers uh, gives you that really pleasure of eating. It First, it gives you the feel of touch. You are touching something. So it's much better than cutting with a knife and a fork, as in there's always a merit of eating with knife and a fork because food has, uh, the hand has germs and stuff like that. But going back into who we are, going back talking about India, going back talking about Indian tradition, the very, very clear, uh, uh, clear uh, uh, diktat and understanding of why should you eat with your hand from Ayurveda. Now, this is an interesting subject, and I think this is where in-store Asia comes into the picture. We are talking, of course, I spoke about the uh, uh, particle dehydrators, aromatizers, um, innovative tableware. Now, if you notice in the table, the table mapping is happening. So I saw quite a bit of projection and mapping happening in quite a few stalls here. Now, that's something is becoming the biggest trend of the dining industry today. So we are merging in technology into our food. We're using table mapping. So you can have a chef coming and cooking for you at the table while your food is getting ready. So you actually see the table chef happening, doing that on your table. You can have the menu uh, been uh, projected. Uh, today we are using restaurant walls. Earlier we used uh, architects and designers. Today we are just using projection. So it's a white wall. One day you're sitting on Hawaii, next day you're sitting in Goa. Third day you're sitting in, in uh, a, a posh restaurant in New York. All that can happen through projection on the wall. And this one of the restaurants, uh, Lady Baga is already doing it. I don't know if anybody's seen it. Some other restaurants are also trying it in India. So various such methods which are part of this industry, which is your industry, today we are uh, uh, intermerging into ours to create these dining experiences. Okay, furniture is very, very interesting subject. Now, uh, we sit down, do we do lounge, we sit up and we eat, sit up and eat straight. We have tall chairs and bar. Now, we all know that the different reasons of uh, having these three sets of furnitures, different reason why we use them in different formats, and uh, th they all have their own merits. And the best way to work with them is to know their utility and use them in the right methodology. Uh, Today, the, the biggest trend in my mind, I was also supposed to be speaking on trends, I think the biggest trend in my mind is India, recreating India, talking about India, representing India in the best way, as in, in the shadow of all that is happening, I think it becomes more and more important, uh, especially the ones who are left here and not run away. We have to represent India in a much better way. Uh, and uh, what uh, better way to represent India than food? So of course, we will have to talk about food in a, a very passionate manner. We'll have to know our food before we talk about food. And the, the best way to do it is understand the synergy between Ayurveda, Indian food, seasonal eatings, uh, regional ingredients, why our grandparents never use medicine and only use food to cure all diseases, and things like that. So again, that's a subject that I would we can always talk about it in length, but just to touch and brush to say that the trend today is India. So I'm not looking at anything else in the world. I keep traveling, but I'm not trying to open an Italian restaurant anymore. I'm not to trying to open a Japanese restaurant anymore. Are we running out of time? Okay. Uh, see, we're in the last slide. <laughs> okay. So uh, uh, trend is India. Trend is uh, w what we are doing. And that is why from the time I think I left Olive, which is 2012, past six years, my journey has been going back to rediscover my past, the, the small towns that I lived in, 
the small village where my grandparents came from. So they came from a small village in Sundarbans. So this year, when I think a lot of us were uh, celebrating Christmas, I went to the Sundarbans to see how the honey is still happening or how the nollen good is still happening. Now, it's, it's mind-boggling to imagine that those areas have still pretty much stayed in the same condition, which was pre-independence or maybe late 40s and 50s till now. Uh, very little electricity, very little modern, uh, you know, uh, equipments or internet and stuff like that. But what we have is we have a wealth of, a wealth of Indian culture, Indian history, Indian legacy. Today, I just give you a quick comparison of what is happening with this Nolan Good story. Of course, it's a, D a DOP and all of that geographically protected product like the Assam tea uh, and things like that. But let's say if you buy a bottle of Nolan Good in any store in CR Park in Delhi or in Calcutta. It's 240 rupees a liter. You buy a liter of uh, good quality palm sugar or palm jaggery, which is either Thailand made or Sri Lanka made, which we're importing into India, is 12 to 1400 bucks a liter, either at Nature's Basket or at Food Hall or any of the shops. Yet we are buying something that we have ourselves and we're not promoting it. This is also a dying art. So just by uh, you know doing DP, nothing really helps. So uh, when I went and saw the 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 most scary uh, findings for me was that it's like maple syrup story. It's something that is completely going away, something that we have to save, something that is almost non-existent. So I wanted to buy, I think I, since I had gone, I said, let me buy six, eight liters and go back to Delhi. I was told that if you stay for five days, we'll be able to give you two liters because the production has become that less. So it's not much just money. So uh, uh, I would constantly you know, uh, go on to do this and keep doing this. And, uh, and keep bringing you this food through uh, the experience of my travel through India, small towns of India. We're in three restaurants in currently in India. Lavash in New Delhi, Big Bruska in Bangalore, and uh, Minority in Pune. Uh, I am also looking at uh, doing a new space this year in Hyderabad. Bombay is freakingly expensive. I've just managed to buy a house after working for 20 years. Uh, so when I have the money to make a restaurant in Bombay, I'll hopefully do it. Uh, so yeah, that brings me to the end. Uh, if you have any questions, do write to me. We can always talk about all the various things that I spoke about. Uh, or you can look us up on all our social platforms. I, I was not supposed to say it. My marketing person said you must say it. You have to say about it. So that's there you go. So it has a Twitter and the Facebook and Instagram, which are not that active at all. Uh, so th uh, that brings me to the end of it. Do we have a question answer? So we hope you've put your questions on. Uh, thank you so much, Chef Sabya Sachi Gorai. You had all of us fall in love with food all over again. And not just the taste, but the smell and the touch. See, there's no better love than food. Interestingly, at Lavash, we have this thing going on. This one says, celebrate love for food. No Valentine, celebrate love for food. Come and get 50% discount. OK. And so I'm going to invite on the stage uh, Ms. Chanda Kumar, who is the editor of BJ Media Works. Please join Sorry. us. She's going to choose three questions from the ones you've uploaded and present them right now. You're going to have to answer them and choose your favorite one. Thank you, Chef. Thank you, Chef, for that wonderful session. Uh, I'm going to go straight away to the questions. The first one is from uh, Gauri uh, Palmer. According to you, which is the most important sensory element when we talk of fine dining? I think uh, as much as I would uh, talk about taste, and I would like to talk about taste uh, you know, uh, very strongly, being a cook, but I think when it comes to fine dining, a large part of it is about uh, what you see. So uh, when, you fr when you get down to the, at the place, to the, your entry, to your lobby, to as you sit down to the furnitures, you go to the washroom, you see your tap fittings, you see how the powder room is. So a lot to do at fine dining is beyond food, so it's also what we see, so I would go with uh, the you know the second, which is uh, that it's seeing. So the food has to look pretty, like I showed a plate, which was a fine dining plate. So yeah, it would be you know the visual appeal. Uh, to the second question, we have from Harshit uh, Singhal. Millennials are constantly looking for change, and it doesn't restrict to new dishes. They want new experience, new ambience. How does a restaurant tackle that? <laughs> Good. If I could answer this one, I would be very successful. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, a very, very uh, 
valid question, actually. We keep asking ourselves this every sev seventh of the month. We have this review meeting, and every time you ask ourselves what to do, price come kar dena, na dish dal do, beer ka thoda, you know, put some beer offer. So this goes on all the time. There's no uh, one way to answer that, but I must tell you that a lot of us constantly are reinventing. Uh, I think what has happened to the millennial generation is very, very good that uh, we grew up with everything fascinated about being imported, being, you know, this is foreign, this is from uh, USA, this is from UK. I think that's ma marginalized. Nobody's looking for that. So uh, to keep this audience engaged, let's talk about us, let's talk about India, let's talk about this vast, beautiful country, uh, its beautiful climatic uh, you know, conditions, biodiversity in every region. I remember that when I put up a picture of tomato in my Instagram, it gets more like than a great uh, uh, you know, pizza picture because people have not seen uh, heirloom tomatoes from Northeast. So I think uh, it is about uh, rediscovering India and the palette is so huge today. I kid you not, there are Michelin restaurants in France uh, copying Indian restaurant dishes or Indian ideas and thought processes. Same been done elsewhere in the world. So uh, I think the w one way to answer this would be to rediscover India, go back into representing India in a better fashion and that would keep us and them engaged also for a very long time. And for the final question, we have from uh, Tanvi Nimbalkar. For food, what should be the marketing ex expenditure balance between great product, detailed communication, and trendy, innovative way of display or plating of food? Just, just repeat that. That's a very long question. Um, what should be the marketing expenditure balance between great food detailed communication and trendy, innovative way of displaying or plating as such? Okay, if I have understood it correctly, um, I'm assuming it is something that we're trying to discuss that how to market the food vis-a-vis -vis what is going on to the plate, right? Okay, uh, so I think it's uh, very similar to the first question, uh, but yes, it is very important today to market your product because uh, most of the uh, people that are our diners are all, all mostly looking and making these choices looking at social media. They don't read a newspaper article or a review anymore. So you have to do things, whether it is in your social media, digital media, or various other platforms to promote yourself, be out there, be visible. So today we're doing road shows, we're participating in various food festivals across the country, we're doing pop-ups in every city. So even if you don't have a restaurant, you go to that city, you, you, know, you rent out or you tell your friend, give me a little space, and you pop up in a restaurant. So that's also become a trend. So you have to market your product, you have to go out there, you have to talk about it. Uh, it is equally important. I can't really put a figure on what is the balance should be, but it's equally important. Uh, I would say 50-50 if it's, uh, you know, it's the same amount of importance that you give on uh, cooking would be the same amount that you'll have to give on marketing, promoting, picturizing, getting lovely pictures, getting presentations. So yeah. And now you've got to choose one of the questions to walk away with a check of 10,000 rupees. Oh, brilliant. Oh. That's an expensive question. I think, I think I'll go with the second one uh, because this pretty much talks about all of us and India and India's future. And it's about the millennial and, and the, and the bright young generation that is going to lead us into the future. So yeah. So Harshit Singhal is walking on the stage right now. Oh, nice. One, okay. Congratulations. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you Thank so you. much, Thank sir. You, Thank, Thank you, you Ms. Kumar. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that was fantastic. A perfectly plated session that was really delicious.